for your life now. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I'm going to start with a personal story. When I was a child, probably a little bit younger than Daniel, I would attend, um, I won't say the name, but a, a Roman Catholic Jesuit school on weekdays. And on Saturday morning, while my brothers and sisters were watching cartoons, I would get ready, get up, put on my only suit, and put on my clip-on tie. At 9 a.m., Brother Johnson, a deacon in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, would pick me up and then pick up the widow down the street. Sister Jelps was her name. And we would drive to services. And matter of fact, you know, it's funny because everyone in the Seventh-day Adventist Church called each other brother and sister. Um, that practice is probably used by a lot of people. But as a little kid, to call her sister was a little strange. But I did. She was a crisply dressed older woman who lived by herself, she was a widow, in her very perfectly arranged home. And I liked her a lot. When I, when I shoveled the snow at my house, I would go down and shovel the snow in front of her as well. And when I raked the leaves, I would rake hers as well so that her yard was always well tended. I loved uh, sitting next to her, to this surrogate mother of mine, who looked a lot like Cecily Tyson, though. Back then, I didn't know who Cecily Tyson was. But now I know that that's what she looked like. She was dressed perfectly and modestly, always wearing a small hat, and she always smelled like soap, clean, very clean. And the servants, she never dozed off. And she always made sure that I paid attention too. Um, as a matter of fact, she kept me satisfied when I started to doze. She would just give me an unsalted cashew nut or a hard rock candy to keep me entertained while I'm rather than falling asleep. Well, when we arrived at service, this was every week, I was shuffled off to be with the other kids downstairs in the, uh, the play area, which I absolutely hated. I wanted to be in the Bible study area with the adults in the sanctuary. One day in class, while drawing and coloring, I just happened to mindlessly um, recite the Ten Commandments exactly as they were written in the King James Version. Something my mother had taught every night, we would always say the Ten Commandments. I know that might have been overkill now, but we would do it every night. But anyway, so this teacher heard, overheard me and um, before I knew what was happening, she escorted me upstairs and there I was standing in this pulpit, not, undi not very different from what we have here. And the choir chairs were behind us and the elders always sat in the chairs, sat on chairs on the, the pulpit behind the minister. And we didn't have a cross. I don't think too many Seventh-day Adventists did have a cross. But we didn't have a cross, but on the back dome behind me was a, a very large painting of Jesus rising up into the clouds with the apostles kind of frozen Hollywood style, you know, the, the whole, oh. <laughs> So I stood there beside this stand, this Bible stand, with very large letters. Now, as my sight starts to disappear, I understand why ministers have these gigantic Bibles with the huge lettering. But back then, it just seemed like it was way too much. So I stood there frozen, looking at my teacher off stage, and she finally got me to move and start, got me gestured for me to get started. And I raised my voice just a little bit, but in the sanctuary with a dome behind you, your voice carries very far. So I stood there terrified, and I recited the Ten Commandments. And to everyone's astonishment, everyone just stood there frozen. I was terrified, but I realized I had done something good, that they just didn't expect to hear from a child. And so from that time on, I got a chance to be upstairs in the Bible study from time to time with the adults. As a matter of fact, um, it wasn't much more than about a year or so after that Ten Commandments incident that I was ushered up onto the platform again, and this time I recited the calling of the apostles. Again, something a little kid probably shouldn't do or shouldn't know. 
But for whatever reason it was, my, my, my memory stuck like that. It would just stick in my head. And so when I got into high school, I was offered a full scholarship to the Seventh-day Adventist Seminary. But by that time, I had gone through what a lot of teenagers go through, which is doubt. Because you see, the things that they tell us about Jesus in school, in class, in sermons, is not always what you read in the Bible. So I began to doubt, and instead I went into the military, just like a lot of young men. Last, last Shabbat, when I knew I had to give this sermon, I prayed to God to ask him, what should I say? What should I, what should I talk about? And I went to bed, and that, that Sunday morning I woke up with a very disturbed dream. Now, I have lots of little dreams, visions about things that are about to happen before they happen. I wish I could put money on it, you know, like get a horse race or something, but it never happens. But these events do happen. So this time I woke up, and I was reciting the Ten Commandments over and over again in my head like a loop. So I thought, okay, another one of those weird dreams. So I set it aside. And then I started working on a sermon. And on Monday morning, I thought, actually it was about Monday afternoon, I thought I had something really good. And I was just rolling along, just doing this sermon. And all of a sudden, now I'm, I work with computers for a living, so hear what I say next. All of a sudden, my screen went blank. All of it, everything was gone. So I clicked undo. No, didn't do it. Then I started, I thought, okay, well, Microsoft Word always retains a copy of your work. So I grabbed another computer and I started trying to find that document. I could not find it. I did not find it. For a few moments, I looked at my phone. I thought, let me call Red Bandian. We'll just pray together and it'll come back somehow. But then I resisted the urge and I realized, okay, Lord, this is not what you wanted me to talk about. So I sat there staring at a blank page with a blinking cursor and I started all over again. And this is the sermon. The Midbar. It means in the wilderness in Hebrew. But in our Bibles, it's called the Book of Numbers. Most of you probably know why. The Greek translators who wrote the Septuagint renamed the books. And the, um, so the book was called Numbers based on the, the census that takes place very early in the book. I don't know that, I don't think God has a particular interest in titles. So from, this, from that point forward, meaning in the, before the time of Yeshua, we had the book of Numbers. Now, in the book of Numbers, we see something very unusual. Um, this is the first time that Adonai rearranges the camp of people. Remember this mixed multitude, some people say millions, definitely hundreds of thousands. Because when you get through counting just the fighting age men, you end up with over 600,000 men alone. And they all had families, large families back then. So we know that it was a very large number. But he rearranged all the tribes. And I think this is really the first time I've seen this in the scriptures where he took groups of men and he arranged them in a, a, certain, in a particular area. And this was the preparation, the preparation he was going to take to move this army people into the promised land. So it's important about, to keep in mind that the book of Numbers is a very unusual book. If I were writing a book about my chosen people, I would probably have all the good stuff in there, all the heroic moments. But Numbers is not written that way. It's very real, very raw. It's exactly what we are, full of mistakes, errors, rebellions. Maybe you don't rebel outwardly, but certainly we all are aware that we have thoughts that are rebellious thoughts. 
And here, for the first time, the children of Israel, like I said, were rearranged in these camps. In the middle were the Levites with the tabernacle, with the Mishkan. <clears throat> On the east, three tribes with Judah as a leader. On the south, there were three tribes with Reuben as a leader. And on the west, three tribes with Ephraim as a leader. And then in the north was Dan with three tribes. Now, when we look at that camp, it was a perfect square with all the families arranged, the men, the fighting men arranged in that order, and the Levites in the middle. I don't know how many of you have ever looked at that and, and thought about something else. Did that, I know we see all the numbers and the whole bit and it gets, it gets a little confusing, but how many of you looked at that arrangement and were inspired by the scriptures to think of something else? Well, I did. I studied the arrangement. As I began to reflect on it, I noticed it looks exactly like New Jerusalem. Now, let me give you a description. This is in Revelation. I don't know how many of us are actually enjoy that book, but I really love it. It's an amazing city, 1,500 miles square, with the brilliance of a diamond, arranged, like I say, as a square, with high walls made of pure diamond and streets of gold as transparent as glass. All 12 gates were pearl, with an angel standing in the front of them. So the 12 tribes were written on each of the gates. Do you see now how numbers correlates exactly to this, the great city that God is preparing for us? He was in the process, Adonai was in the process, of creating for the first time an army that reflected the armies that would be on the earth. You see, in Revelation, he's called the God of Heaven's armies. So here for the first time, men were being arranged in a certain fashion that represented the great God of heaven. It was the very first time anything like this had happened. Normally that is not how an army is arranged. Those of us who uh, have served or maybe witnessed know that armies are arranged linear, one in front of the other. Anyone who watched the Ukrainian war understand that they lead off in a long line and they reach their point and at that point they begin to attack and it's the first group and then the next group. Here was a different arrangement completely. God's intention at this time was that Israel was going to be a kingdom of priests and kings that were going to spread out and conquer the earth. Now he said that repeatedly. The problem is that the people at that time did not have the help that they needed to be able to say, believe, simply to believe. That destiny actually still awaits Israel, but God has changed the formula. He's added others to the mix. So this will still happen. Anyone who reads the book of Ezekiel and Revelation know that this will definitely come to take place. But not yet. Not at this time. So let me take it, let me take you through before we start talking about Shavuot, let me take you back a little bit, a little bit further. The first Sabbath on the day of rest. In Passover, or the Days of Unleavened Bread, we've been asked to count 50 days. Tonight, Shavuot begins, sunset. And if you are like all of us, which I know because I was on the prayer lines, we counted 50 days. Shavuot, or Shabbos, as our Ashkenazi brothers say, has many names including the Festival of Weeks. There's uh, Hag Shavuot, 
And then there's another name that comes from the Greek, which is Pentecost. But in my mind, I have never really fully understood how they connect until I began to put this sermon together for the second time. The holy day, this holiday, this holy day, commemorates the day when the children of Israel, who were delivered from slavery in Egypt, are to make themselves ready, and they were garnered at the base of the mountain at Mount Sinai. So before we have the name Shavuot, the people were to make themselves ready and to gather at the base of Sinai. Now according to the sages, and possibly a very cryptic description in Numbers 19, this corresponded to the date of Shavuot, but we had not been given that name yet. So they were gathered, they were asked to prepare themselves to see and to hear the glory of God, of Adonai. And so each year, since that time, since Mount Sinai, the people who have gathered, first is all of Israel, and later just the Jews, they renew the giving of the commandments in the Torah. Some Jews stay up all night studying the Torah. Mm -hmm. the, day of the, of the day is actually a Sabbath day, so we should not be doing normal work that day. You can take care of your homes, your families, which is what God intended, but it is not a work day. We can't earn wages. It's customary to eat dairy foods on that day, like cheese blences, quiche, and casseroles. Pentecost, on the other hand, is found in the book of Acts. Pentecost comes from the Greek word Pentecoste. On the same day that the commandments are given at Mount Sinai, the Holy Spirit is poured out on Yeshua's disciples. That's pretty much the only connection that we have to say Pentecost Shavuot. But I'm going to make a couple of comparisons here and try and close this gap a little bit better. The Holy Spirit, as we know, the Ruach HaKodesh, is the helper that Yeshua, that Yeshua promised. The helper guides us into spiritual knowledge about the scriptures, and it also leads us to a deeper understanding of Adonai. It also binds us together as brothers and sisters. The Hebrew Sheva means seven, and the week is called Shavua. So Shabbos, or Shavuot, refers to 70, 70, or weeks, seven weeks. And that number, as you all know, seven is a, a mystical number. It represents the natural or physical order and it also gives, in, in itself, it has the concept of completeness. Our week is based on those seven days. So, in the days of the Mishkan in the temple, the natural cycle was agricultural. Everything was based on an agricultural model. All of the festivals are arranged in agricultural models. And <clears throat> Shavuot, up until a certain time, is based on agricultural activities. As a matter of fact, Shavuot also has other names. It's called Yom Ha Bikurim, the day of the first fruits. It's also called Hag Hakatir, harvest feast. And it's also called a name that we don't use very often, Yom Ha, -ka Yom -ha -ka Hal which is the day of assembly. And all of these names are appropriate because what God is doing is giving us a physical model before he helps us to understand the spiritual. These natural cycles are in effect a lesson that was going to lead us to something much greater. Now consider this for a moment. Seven weeks and seven days are the complete agricultural cycle or the natural cycle, right? So why does Shavuot take place on the 50th day? Has anyone ever asked that? Why seven, seven, and then we end up with an extra day? Well, as I started putting this, this 
study together, I began to realize that the reason why there's an extra day, just like the extra day with the Jubilee, is because God is trying to teach us something much deeper than that. So he gives us a natural agricultural cycle, and then he gives us that extra day. And it's been there from the beginning, from the very first time these words were given. It's just never seen or never thought about. God is indicating that he is creating a different cycle, a spiritual cycle. So there's a natural cycle and then a physical cycle. And this has always been in the text. We just have not been able to understand it or to read it. You could say that the spiritual harvest with Yeshua as the first fruit begins with his, with his ascension, while the rest of the spiritual harvest, those who belong to him, marked by the Spirit, has been taking place since Pentecost in Acts 2, and it's still taking place today. You see, how many of you realize that we are still in the middle of a harvest? And it's an unusual harvest. Because he pours out his spirit on everyone, but not everyone seems to respond. How many of you have tried to get your best friend to respond? Or a family member? It doesn't work. Because they are not bound with Yeshua. And that makes uh, all of the difference. You see, when he asks us to count 50 days, and we have turned it into counting omers, but he asks us to count 50 days. How many of you know what an omer is? Anyone? An omer is a tenth of a partial, a tenth of a, you know how they collect the wheat and the, you know, the way they used to do it. They would collect into these big bundles. Well, the priest didn't wave that whole big bundle. He waved a tenth of it. He would take it and wave the tenth of it. And that tenth was to represent, or that tithe, we all know tithe, that tithe was to represent the whole bundle. So what Yeshua is doing, or what he did, is he is the first fruit. He was the reason why we were counting the Omer. And yet, in the scriptures that we read, his name is never mentioned. They seem totally disconnected, don't they? It's like we're counting the Omer, and none of us have taken the time to think about why are we counting the Omer? What is an Omer? <laughs> I never asked what was an Omer. I just assumed that that's what we do. Well, in it, was always the beginning of a different harvest. That tenth was to be waved, and it was to be waved at the beginning, that first Sabbath. Then you were to count 50 days. Now, as you know, or as I've just mentioned, that harvest that began when Yeshua ascended is still going on right now. It's never ended. Do you know when the harvest actually ends? Yeah, it seems like that, right? No, it doesn't. It doesn't end then. It actually ends in the book of Revelation when he sends the angel out to gather all of those who have passed away. That's the first harvest. You see, we never looked at it that way. We looked at it as like, oh, the saints are going to get saved, and these people are going to get saved, and Jews are going to be resurrected, and the whole bit. But it was never intended to be the whole resurrection. Not from the beginning, from the very first holy day. It was always pointing toward a new harvest of people. So Pentecost simply closed the gap. It closed the circle. You see, but now let's, let's go ahead and take a look at this, all right? I'm going to read for you from Revelation 7. And I'll let you find out which verse it is. A huge crowd, too large for anyone to count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language. And when I was a kid, I thought that meant the whole world. But it isn't. They were standing in front of the throne and in front of the Lamb, dressed in white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. And they shouted, Victory to our God who sits in the throne and to the Lamb. You see how we can get our focus kind of drawn off by customs and traditions without noticing the, the, the messages that are hidden in? So for the rest of this time, I want to focus on Yam Ha, Yam Ha, 
Bikurim, the first fruits. Because you see, that's what we were doing. We were cut that omer, that first omer that was waived by the high priest was a tenth. And when you when I get through, you'll see how it connects perfectly. In Leviticus 23, starting in verse 9, Adonai said to Moshe, Tell the people of Israel, after you enter the land I'm giving you, and the harvest is right, it's, uh, ripe crops, you are to bring a sheaf of the first fruit of your harvest to the Kohen. Now I said sheaf because that's what our scriptures say, but the truth is it says ha-omer, which means a tenth. It was never a sheaf. We just mistranslated that. You were to bring a tenth or a tithe of the sheaf to the high priest to wave. We are to wave the sheep before Adonai so that you will be accepted. And that's what we hear in the prayer that we read all the time, is that it's going to cleanse us of sins and we will be accepted. The Kohen is to wave it on the day after the Shabbat. On the day that you wave the sheep, you are to offer a male lamb without defect and the rest of the offerings that go along with that offering as a burnt offering for Adonai. So the high priest was to take this tenth, wave this sheaf, and then from that point on, we were supposed to count. But that sheaf, like I said, that sheaf represents the entire harvest. It is not all of the harvest. So the Kohen will wave it to the east, to the south, the west, and the north, in similar arrangement to the people that he arranged in the camp. And then going on in verse 13, its grain offering is to be one gallon of fine flour mixed with olive oil, an offering made by fire to Adonai as a fragrant aroma. It also has a drink offering, which is wine, one quart. You are not to eat bread, dried grain, or fresh grain until the day you bring the offering for your God, which we do not do. This is a permanent regulation throughout all your generations, no matter where you live. So when are we to do this? From the day after the day of rest, that is, from the day you bring the sheaf, or the tenth of the sheaf, for waving. You are to count seven full weeks until the day after the seventh week. You are to count 50 days, and then you are to present a, gra a new grain offering to Adonai. Notice I emphasize the word new. You must bring from your homes two loaves. Very special loaves, actually. And I never noticed this in all the years of study and seminary and all that. I never noticed that God did something different in this offering that he has never done before and never does after. He says, you must bring bread from your homes for waving. Two loaves made with a gallon of fine flour baked with leaven. No offering ever gets offered on the altar with leaven. This is the only one. As first fruits for Adonai. This is the only offering. You can search your scriptures. This is the only offering where God says, bring leavened bread to be offered. Now, why would he do that? I've kind of given you the answer already. Along with the bread, present seven lambs. And I'm going to go ahead and skip through the rest of that because you can read this for yourself. These are the standard sacrifices. But I'm going to skip ahead to verse 19. Offer one male goat as a sin offering and two lambs. Male, uh, two lambs, one year old, as a sacrifice of a peace offering. You see, Shavuot is much more important than we place the emphasis on. A lot of us think, oh, it's about staying up all night, you know, eating, uh, you know, dairy cheesecake and blintzes and the whole bit, and studying the Bible. No, it was so much more important than that. It was a, it's the only offering where God makes a sacrifice of peace to people, to us, to humanity. The Kohen will wave with the bread of the first fruits, a wave offering before Adonai with the two lambs. And then again, as I say, it's, it's the, the regular offering, so I won't go through it in detail because you can read that. Adonai mirrors in the physical what is in the spiritual for us to see and learn. During Passover, the Passover season, that Yeshua offered himself as a perfect sacrifice, it was acceptable to the Father. And if we had, if we had fully understood exactly what was going on, which we couldn't because even his apostles could not, because we were missing something. If we had understood that, we would know what was to happen. 
During the Passover season, he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice acceptable to the Father. And then three nights and three days later, he rises. That same weekly Sabbath, Yeshua rose on, the high priest was in the temple waving the leavened bread from their homes. Now, remember that week? He rose, everybody's excited, we're all happy. Things were still going on in the temple. That very same day, that very same day, they were offering the sacrifice of first fruits, peace with mankind. It was a sacrifice of a peace offering between sinful man, which is represented by Levin, and Adonai. And it was his sacrifice. Most of the other sacrifices are based on we sin and we go to the high priest and confess our sins and then we get cleansed. This one was very different from all the rest. And that's why he didn't put a date on it. God has not fixed a date for the recovery of his people. And that's why he keeps going on and on and on. Paul thought, oh, it's going to happen in my lifetime. All the apostles thought, oh, it's going to happen in my lifetime. And I will be willing to bet that every single minister, rabbi, priest, has thought, it's going to happen in my lifetime. God has not put a date on it. That's why he said, there's Passover, then count 50 weeks, 50 days. Count 50 days, right? And we all know that the day means something very different to God. Now, this, let me continue. So at the time, the Kohen were waving a peace offering in the temple the larger crowds who could not fit in the courtyard, which uh, if you had heard my earlier sermons, there were approximately a, a, about a million or so people there in Jerusalem. They would come from all over the world. So they all couldn't fit into the courtyard. So most of them were standing around in the streets. Okay? So now, let's consider what's happening. The priest is offering the wave offering, first fruits, the leavened bread. Many of the people are outside because they can't get in the temple. They can't see what's going on. So they're just milling around in the streets. And now, what happens? I want to save that for a moment. Um, first, before we go forward, let's, let's consider something. Most of us know that there was darkness on the land when Yeshua died, from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. Why do you think that time is unique? Why do you think God went through the effort to mention the exact time when he doesn't do that for anything else? Well, you can say, oh, it was his son, but no, it was much more. Again, it was a learning curve, a learning lesson for us. You see, how do we know when the sacrifices were offered? Because the sages, whom we sometimes don't say flattering things about, they recorded lots of details before the temple fell. One of them is that the morning sacrifices were always offered at 9 a.m. and the evening at 3 p.m. Yeshua, darkness fell on the land from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. the day that he sacrificed himself. The, everything was playing out exactly as it was, as it was written in the Torah. Now, let's go ahead and look. Let's go back to that 50 days later. And we're in Jerusalem, and the priest has offered the, the sacrifice, the, uh, the peace sacrifice. And all the people are milling around Jerusalem, listening, talking, whatever it was. It was early in the morning. It was about 9 o'clock. It was early in the morning. So let's, let's pick this up in the book of Acts. The festival of Shavuot arrived. And the believers all gathered in one place in Jerusalem. Suddenly there came a sound from the sky like the roar of a violent wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire, which separated and came to rest on each one of them. They were all filled with the Ruach HaKadosh and began to talk in different languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. Now, they were all staying in Jerusalem for the religious holidays. But in that, at that time period, now let me go back to the book of Acts. Now, there were, staying in Jerusalem, religious pilgrims from every nation under heaven. 
When they had heard the sound, a crowd gathered. They were confused because each one heard the believers speaking in his own language. Totally amazed, they asked, how is this possible? Aren't all of these people who are speaking from Galil, from Galilee, the farmers, lower classes, they're not very educated. They didn't go to Rome to speak. They didn't go, they didn't go to uh, the other nations, Parthia, Medes, which is uh, Iraq, Iran, um, Mesopotamia, Judah, Greece, I'm using the modern names, and Egypt, and Libya. So these Jews were here from their different lands, each one speaking their own language, and they heard the apostles speaking to them in their own language, and yet these are farmers or fishermen from Galileo. Not possible. Going back to the script, to the scriptures, how is it that we hear them speaking in our own languages about the great things God has done? Amazed and confused, they all went on asking each other, what can this mean? But others made fun of them and said, they're just, they just had too much wine. And this is, uh, it's, it's worth, I want to point this out because, okay, all the people in the streets heard this commotion. They saw something going on. They, and at that time, the houses were not like where they're built now. There was a porch pretty much on every top of the house, like an open area where people gathered and met because it's hot in the summer and the whole bit. So everybody sees what's going on. We're also not talking about tall buildings. <clears throat> We're talking about one, two-story buildings at best. So you can look out over the valley in Israel and see exactly what rooftop that's going on. So all the people rush over there. And another event had happened like this once before. Actually, several events. The sages in Israel point out that when Adonai appeared on, the, on Mount Sinai, on that first Shavuot, which was unnamed Shavuot at that time, the giving of the commandments, that the nations of the world, possibly those same nations mentioned in Acts, heard the Ten Commandments rattle across the skies. Think about that for a moment. So, it might seem a little bit far-fetched, but I don't think so. Because the Egyptians never doubted the God of Israel. The kings of Babylon never doubted the God of Israel, especially Nebuchadnezzar, after he was humbled. And his son came to, to believe in the God of Israel. If you go to Daniel 5 and look at the reading there, the entire book of Daniel is actually very, very good. But if you go to Daniel 5, you'll notice that Daniel is in the court of Belteshazzar. I'm sorry, in the court of the son of Nebuchadnezzar. And when the hand writes on the wall, everybody saw it. All those drunken people there drinking out of vessels from the Mishkan, all of them saw it. And they all got really scared and started trembling. They all tried to figure out what was going on. God makes himself known to the world leaders all the time. It's just that most of them don't recognize it don't understand it, and would think that you would think that they are a fool for saying these things. But it has been going on, and it's still going on. So let's go back to Acts. Then Kepha stood up with the eleven and raised his voice to address them. You Judeans, all of you staying here in Yerushalayim, let me tell you what this means. Listen carefully to me. These people aren't drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. What did I say was happening at nine in the morning? At nine in the morning in the temple, the sacrifice, the first fruit sacrifice with 11 bread was being offered. And now for the first time, we're seeing the Holy Spirit being poured out on people, regular, ordinary, sinful folks just like us. Now this was spoken about through the prophet Joel, Adonai says, in the last days I will pour out from my spirit, I will pour out my spirit upon everyone. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I guess I know what I am now. 
old man because I keep having this cringe, right? <laughs> <laughs> even on my even on slaves both men and women will I pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy I will perform miracles in the sky above and signs on the earth below and I'll let you continue reading that that's in the book of Acts in the second chapter my point was this these events are not disconnected. They're se they're not they're they're separated. They're I'm sorry, they appear to be separated, but they're not. They're not separated. They're connected. At the same time that the priests were waving that offering in the temple, the Holy Spirit comes in a storm wind and drops down on this rooftop and reaches out to these men who are now go over to the ed the ledge and start prophesying in the languages that they have could never have learned. And what time was it? 9 a.m. It's always been in the scriptures there for us to read it and to see. So why is it that many of us have not noticed? I believe it's because the Holy Spirit, which reveals these things, testifies of Yeshua in the scriptures. Now maybe he doesn't have to do it to every one of us one individually. Maybe that's what he entrusts these old men will stand up here and do to help you to see these things so you can go back and reread those scriptures and see what the Holy Spirit is showing. Let me put it a different way. God became the Son of Man, and the Son of Man defeated death. And God raised up the Son of Man to his side. Paul says it this way. But the fact is that the Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. And I'm going to depart from the scriptures a little bit because the natural cycle up until up until Yeshua's sacrifice was that you would be born, you grow old, and then you die. That's the natural cycle. That's Shavuot. That's the natural cycle. It's just going to happen to us. There would have been no hope if it weren't for the foreknowledge of the Father who put in motion a sacrifice of peace offering of his only son. And it's a sacrifice that's buried in the scriptures that we barely notice, that we don't even know or even look at or understand. But it's there. He then tested the father of Isaac and Jacob to see if he was willing, Abraham, if he was willing to give up his only son. This, his, this whole narrative is not made up. It's not, it was pre-planned. When Abraham, in faith, and love in God was willing to give up his own son, then I and I knew this was the family. These are the people. These are the people I'm going to work with. He found the family on which to build his nation. We live in an environment of sin and we sin every day in our thoughts and sometimes in our actions. But one was able to break that cycle. No one was able to break that cycle until the father sent his son, his only son, born as a man into a sinful world and he walked the earth and he never sinned. So he defeated temptation. Now why am I saying that? Okay. I have a reason for it. He walked the earth but never sinning and he defeated temptation. Continuing on with uh, Paul's statement. For since death came through a man also the resurrection of the dead has come through a man. For just as in connection with Adam all die, so in connection with the Messiah, all will be made alive. But, remember that I said that you can't just bring your brothers and your friends and your family in? Because there's an order to it. In the connection with the Messiah, all will be made alive. But each in his own order. That's why I can't break my brother's hard head. That's why I can't get them to see the thing, same things I see. That's why I can't get the people who were in my seminary class who were ordained to see the things that I see. And trust me, I've tried. But each in his own order. The Messiah is the first fruit. And then those who belong to the Messiah at the time of his coming. Then the culmination. You see, the first harvest is still underway. There's going to be a resurrection of those who belong to Yeshua, who are written in the book of life. And then he's going to come back 
and raise up the rest. Because there is no death at this point. Death has been defeated. And I know it's sad when people pass away. Oh my God, the grief is unbearable. But not a single soul is lost. The Messiah is the first fruits. Then those who belong to the Messiah at the time of his coming. Then the culmination. Then he hands over the kingdom of God to the Father. After having put an end to every rulership. Yes, to every authority and power. Daniel saw in his visions future events in his time and future events in ours. I kept watching in the night visions when I saw, coming with the clouds of heaven, someone like a son of man. He approached the ancient one and was led, and was led into his presence. By the way, Daniel was not considered a major prophet in Judaism. It's because the things that he wrote about are astounding. They make no sense whatsoever. Who is the son of man? What did Yeshua call himself when he came? Son of man. To him was given rulership, glory, and a kingdom so that all peoples, nations, and languages should, should serve him. His rulership is an eternal rulership that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Remember, Shavuot is a harvest time. In the days of Israel, in the beginning, God had made promises to Israel that if you do these things, harvest will come. Seasons will come in their proper time. But I know that he knew that they could not do it. So we say Yeshua was our Passover sacrifice, and it's true. But he is also Lord of the harvest as well. He's gone ahead. He's defeated temptation. He's defeated death. And now he's harvesting his people. I've counted the Omer for many years. Many people count it for a blessing. It's actually written in the words. This year, I went to Yeshua, I went to God, and I asked him, where is Yeshua in the Omer? And I got the answer. And I just, it was just a little bit much. And that's what I'm sharing with you now. I got the answer. He is in the Omer. I've had my eyes open. The Passover and the counting of the Omer and Shavuot, or Pentecost, are one. They're not disconnected. They're not separate feasts. It's a continuous time period. They are one. And they are the Father's promise of salvation. We should be excited because it means that he's already put in, plan, put in motion the plan to first redeem the people who he is, who are going to serve with Yeshua, to help clean up the mess. And then he's going to raise everybody else. So the first Shavuot, Adonai gave the children of Israel his marriage contract, the Ten Commandments. At Sinai, a new kind of nation has been created. And now, each year after the Passover, offered up animal sacrifices in the very next Sabbath, a tithe of the harvest was waived. And then seven weeks and seven days, seven weeks of seven days passed. And then on the 50th day, a jubilee of weeks. It's not written in the scriptures, that's my phrase I use. It's a jubilee of weeks. Because it's 50. It's 49 days, as he commanded. And then on that 50th day, a time of release is made. A sacrifice of peace was offered. On the 50th day, the jubilee of weeks, two leavened loaves were offered along with the prescribed sacrifices. Oh, by the way, um, there's another part to this. And I'm going to do that on Tuesday night when we have our, our uh, Bible study. I'm going to show you how uh, Yeshua, after his resurrection, didn't just drift around and arbitrarily appear here and there. It actually took place during the days of the Omer, the counting of the Omer. And you see what I mean by we just read over stuff and don't really notice it? You see, the time of the Omer is the time that he was walking around, speaking to people, his disciples, appearing first to Mary and to the women, 
and then later on to his disciples and to those from far apart. It's not random. It is one event. They are interconnected. Allow me a moment. Um, I'm skipping over portions. Because some of these things you can ask during the Bible study. And by the way, that's what I love about our Bible studies. We're not, it's not me saying everything to you. It's you asking questions on the same subject. It's not just the guy reads and then you guys listen and go home and take notes. Okay, so coming back to what Paul said, I wanted to repeat that. I'm having problems with my script. Allow me a moment. I'm thirsty. Um, let's see. Yeah, it's hot up here. I'm very dry. Okay. I'm going to take you back. I want to show you how interconnected these things are. The promises revealed in the Passover and Shavuot were just in the beginning. They were, actually, I'm sorry, ordained, set up in motion from the very beginning to show us that there's a greater harvest of mankind that's coming. It's the destiny of all men and women who are bound to Yeshua at this time to, be like, to become like him. Let me give you what Yeshua said to his disciples in the garden. He understood, thank you, he understood that they did not understand what was going on. He said, I didn't tell you this at first because I was with you, but now I'm going to the one who sent me. Not one of you is asking me, where are you going? Instead, because I have said these things to you, you are overcome with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. <laughs> How many people notice that word advantage? It's to your advantage that, I, that he went away. He said that. So, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the comforting counselor will not come to you. Skipping ahead in that same place in the garden. I still have many things to tell you, but you aren't able to hear them right now. However, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but will say only what he hears. He will also announce to you the events of the future. He will glorify me because he will receive from what is mine and announce it to you. Everything the Father has is mine. And this is why I said that he receives from what is mine and will announce it to you. That's in John 16. The spirit of truth, which was poured out on Pentecost, literally seals and binds us to Yeshua. Paul said it like this in 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone is united with the Messiah, he is a new creation. I have been thinking about this ever since I wrote this down. And I realized that I am not the same kid that I was. I'm not the same person that I was in the military. I am not the same person. A, different, a difference is happening in me. I have a more tender heart than I ever had before. I almost have to guard it and protect it because men are not supposed to cry. I don't know who told you. <laughs> Men are not supposed to cry. So where are these tears coming from? I, he says, Therefore, if anyone is united with the Messiah, he is a new creation. We need to start looking at that and looking to see how we are not the same. We're not the same. The old one has passed away. Look, what has come is fresh and new. We need to change our outlook. 
We need to change our outlook about Shavuot. We need to change our outlook about Passover and unleavened bread and about the sacrifices. We need to change our outlook, but we also need to understand that there is a new way of thinking available to us, a new mind. And it is all through God who through the Messiah, going back to the scriptures, it is all through God who through the Messiah has recon reconciled us to him. I'm sorry, to himself. And has given us the work of that reconciliation. I think in some ways, when you're doing what God wants you to do, that's when you can feel that you're a different person. You're empowered in a way that you would not have had the confidence to do before. I was terrified to stand in front of those adults and do what I did as a child. I'm terrified to stand in front of you now and speak as I do. But for some reason, I've been able to do it, and I don't know why. I do know why. Because I'm not the same person I was. And we all have to start looking for that in our lives. All, everyone around us, everyone here, your families, they probably see some things in you that you can't see. You are not the same person you were before you came to understand who Yeshua was and before he gave you his spirit. So, he has also given us the work of reconciliation, which is that God in the Messiah was reconciling mankind to himself, not counting their sins against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. We should be the person at the funeral who's not crying. You know, in New Orleans, when a person dies, they have a festival, they go out in the streets, they play instruments, and they dance and party. And I've been to some of those parties, not in New Orleans, but in my own family. When someone dies, they go back to the house and people are celebrating. I'm like, what is going on? You know, in some ways, we need to adapt that a little bit. Because if that person was in Yeshua, man, he's there waiting. He's one of those people with a new robe and a harp, waiting, waiting for the rest of us to get our act together. Think about that. Don't be so sad. Understand that you, that Death has been defeated. Therefore, we are ambassadors of the Messiah. In effect, God is making his appeal through us. What we do is appeal on behalf of the Messiah. Be reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20. Think about it this way. The two loaves represented on Shavuot have leavening in them. They are the only loaves ever presented to God in sacrifice with leaven in them. And as we know, leaven represents sin. So it means you do not have to be perfect to be an ambassador of Yeshua. You should be free. <laughs> you know, you have nothing to fear. You don't have to be perfect. If somebody says, yeah, but you are, uh, you know, <laughs> you can say that's true. Not be afraid of it. Think about it. I'm saying to each and, one, each and every one of you, you do not have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be an ambassador of Yeshua. Yeshua is indeed the first fruit, and he has bound us with him and given us the spirit of truth. In doing so, he has begun a new harvest. We should be excited. A new harvest, bound by the living Holy Spirit, which was poured out on Pentecost, the same day of the natural harvest. Paul says in Colossians, also, he is head of the body, the Messianic community. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that we might hold first place in everything. So, I'm sorry. So that he might hold first place in everything. For if it pleases God to have the full being live in his son, to have his full being live in him, And through his son to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace through him, through having his son shed his blood by being executed on a stake. Paul says, for just as in connection with Adam, all die, so in connection with the Messiah, all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Then the culmination. James said, having made this his decision, the 
Father. He gave birth to us through a word. And that word I capitalize as W-O-R-D, word, because that is also his name. That is the name of Adonai. That can be relied upon in order that we should be a kind of first fruits of all that he created. And many times, and in many ways, God spoke long ago to the fathers through the prophets. In these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he created the universe. This son is the radiance of his glory and the imprint of his being, upholding all things by his powerful word, which is something, stepping away from the scripture, something that, that uh, Mahara says. Upholding all things by his powerful word, that word, that tongue that we have, that gets us in trouble, can also get us out of trouble. Amen. When he made purifications for all sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Thus, he became as far above the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of his angels did God ever say, you are my son? Today I am become your father. And if we're bound to Yeshua, he's talking to us. Think about that for a moment. You are my son. Today I have become your father. And again, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And regarding the angels, he said, he makes his angels winds and his servants a flame of fire. Amen. But regarding the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of uprightness is the scepter of our, our king of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And in the beginning, Adonai, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They shall pass away, but you remain. And think about that for a moment. If you're bound with Yeshua, I keep saying this, I want you to sink in. If you're bound with Yeshua, the earth will pass away, but you will remain. They will all wear out like clothing, and like a robe, you will roll them up, and like clothing, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years shall never end. To, but to which of the angels has the Father ever said, sit in my right hand, and I make your enemies your footstool, a footstool for your feet. Shavuot Pentecost, Shavuot slash Pentecost, allows us to meditate. I hope you understood the things I've said today. How interconnected they are, they're not separated. So you should go back and study the Ten Commandments. Like he tried to tell me that first night, but I was too hard-headed to understand what he was saying. <laughs> the blessing of the sacrifice is given to us Teach us spiritual things. If you read your Bible with the understanding that there's, there's a spirit in you that's going to show you these things, you can't help but be excited. Also, I'd like for you to read the book of Daniel it's, and the book of the uh, Messianic Jews, also called Hebrews, which reminds us of our hope and the king who suffered, who offered himself up, offered up his life, that we may be bound to him forever and ever. It's good news, folks. It's the best news you could ask, you could possibly ask for. What did he say to the to uh, Lazarus' sister? Thank you. What did he say to Lazarus' sister? I won't answer it for you. She said she cried, came to him crying, and she said, "If you had been here." And what did he say to her? Look that up. Thank you, people. I hope um, I know this was long. I apologize. It's something I really needed to say because I asked these questions and I got them answered. And I'm grateful to get share that with you from the scriptures. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.